and welcome to Bread Garden Market's second uh, The Wine Cash Wine Club video class. Uh, quick note, I was filming the class for the Vino File right before this one. And as I come in and out of the shots, you're gonna notice a little stain, it happens. First time I've worn a decent shirt in about eight months. And of course, I spill wine on it, red wine to boot. So what are we doing here this month? We are doing the French sampler. So again, I choose a topic that's really super broad. France, it's not like they make a lot of wine or anything. Um, they make, uh, I believe the second most wine per capita in the world or third. They go back and forth with Italy and Spain, but because it's the Wine Cash Club, we are talking about lesser known regions, harder to find stuff, things that are a little unusual, things that represent great value for the dollar, uh, things that a good sommelier, which I am not, will try to find for you at a restaurant. Um, it's, it's really um, the club I have usually the most fun picking out wines for. Now that being said, uh, for this club, I thought, Unusual, France, we'll just knock some stuff out. It took me like three weeks to figure this out. I changed wines about eight different times. Um, so I hope you appreciate the effort and angst that went into me picking out these wines. Um, being such a broad topic, where do we start? What are we talking about? So we're gonna do this video in a few different parts here. First, we're gonna do like a broad overview of France, the major wine regions, maybe how to read a label a little bit. And then we're gonna get super narrow in our focus and talk mostly about the wines and regions that we're gonna be sampling and that you're gonna be drinking um, with your subscription to the clubs. So first, uh, let's talk about France a little bit as a wine region. Uh, France is the benchmark for great wines of the world. Um, you might like wines of Italy better. You might like wines from California better. Um, but there is no doubt that France has influenced the wine world and winemaking in a way that no other country has. They were the earliest, they were the best, and many would argue they still are the best at producing everything from simple table wines to super high-end Bordeaux, Burgundies, and Rhones. Um, France seems to have a lock on this in general. The same could be said of French cheeses, certainly, um, and French cuisine. Um, again, benchmark for the rest of the world for a long time. So they're gourmands. They know what they're doing in the alcohol, cheese, and food world. So let's quickly go over some of the major wine regions of France. Knowing wine regions in France is very important to knowing what kind of wine you're drinking. Uh, as we'll get to in a second. Although some of this has changed recently, the French still, for the most part, do not put varietals on their labels. Again, there are some exceptions, um, but this is still true for the most part. So knowing your basic regions is important because that's how you know what grapes are in them, really. Um, you can certainly look on the internet and Google the wines. It's a lot easier nowadays than it was 20 or 30 years ago to figure out what the heck is in this bottle of Savoie, or this is Sancerre, so what am I drinking? But again, France focuses on place, region. Um, if you know, for example, that a wine is from the Loire and specifically from Puy Fume, and it's white, Sauvignon Blanc. It'll never say Sauvignon Blanc on the label, but Puy Fume has to be Sauvignon Blanc. So let's go and look quickly at some of these wine regions here. So. Yeah, we got the mirror thing going on, so this is gonna be backwards. As we get a bigger budget for these, as we get a little more practice and we get about 150 to 200 more members, we'll get like a graphics department. We'll work and sort this stuff out. But for now, imagine this is backwards, because it is. And if you've already had a couple of drinks of the wine that you've gotten in your wine club package, this is gonna be really interesting. But basically, this is the Atlantic Ocean, okay? Major wine regions off of the Atlantic. You have Bordeaux, 
Most people have heard of Bordeaux. We'll get into Bordeaux a little more detail later, but this is a premium red wine making region. It's also home to the arguably greatest dessert wine appellation in the world in Sauternes. Uh, they also make some great whites, which are usually blends of Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, a little Muscadel sometimes. If we go a little north here, we're going to hit the Loire Valley. We're going to have a, a wine from the Loire um, in this month's package as well. Uh, the Loire is a huge winemaking region, very, very varied in terms of what kind of, they grow 20, 30, 40 different grapes, depending upon what region you're in. Um, so as you go across the Loire, the different varieties of grapes and producers you encounter are incredibly numerous. So now if we head a little east or west in the case of our mirror image video here, uh, about 90 miles northeast of Paris, we have Champagne. If we head down Sam south from Champagne, we hit Burgundy. And kind of Burgundy has a north and south region and then we'll hit the Rhone Kind of hit northern Rhone, this kind of tiny little purple dot here, and southern Rhone, Gingandash, Chateauneuf du Pape, Vacaras. Kind of hit the Languedoc, Roussillon region in here, Provence, so on and so forth. So those are the major regions. Uh, let's see if we missed. Well, Alsace would kind of be a little further north and east of, um, well, I guess east of Champagne, excuse me. Alsace produces fantastic Pinot uh, Blancs, Riesling certainly, some of the best Rieslings in the world come from Alsace, Gewürztraminer, um, some really neat Pinot Noir, cold weather Pinot Noir, very different than the Pinot Noirs that most people drink from Oregon, California, or even Burgundy. Um, Sudwest is actually kind of this region right in here. So Sudwest kind of Cahors we're talking about here. So a region that's famous for Malbec, but a little different style than you would get in Argentina. Uh, we're gonna drink a Malbec later, but not from Cahors or the Southwest, um, but actually from the Loire, which would be very interesting. Um, you also get kind of wines in the Armagnac, Cognac region as well. Uh, those wine regions are famous for brandy, but there's actually some uh, fantastic wines from an area called Gascon, um, which makes really nice, fresh, crisp, uh, little white wines made from the same grapes, Colombard and Blanc that you find in Cognac and Brandy. So anyway, those are the kind of the main regions. And if we work backwards, that's kind of the loop that we kind of go around and then head to the Southwest in the Pyrenees, uh, kind of by the Spanish border there. Now that we have all that covered, uh, we are gonna, talk about wine labels a little bit. So don't worry about this. France is a pretty difficult region uh, as a whole to understand. If you've been collecting and drinking wine for 15, 20 years, less so. If you're in the business, less so. Um, but for a lot of people, you know Bordeaux, you know Burgundy, you know certainly Champagne. Um, but a lot of these other regions are gonna be a little alien and that's what's fun. That's what's cool, that's what's different about. Um, and. Uh, unique about doing this type of thing is kind of discovering new things. Um, so let's kind of jump into the labels uh, really quick and then we'll kind of get into the wine. So France has always been about place in terms of, well, everything they do um, in the wine sense, in a cheese sense, where does something come from? That's more important than anything else. Um, the place can be very general or somewhat specific. And we've covered a lot of this in other classes. Um, you can just have a wine, red wine label Bordeaux. So that would be more of a generic general label. And then you can have very specific regions within Bordeaux, like on the left bank, the Medoc or a hot Medoc. And then you get even more specific. You could have Poyac or St. Julian. Um, on the right bank, you can have Pomerol or saint Emilion or Saturn. So again, if we're talking like coast, concentric circles, like we talked about in classes before, place can be very broad, it can be very narrow. And a lot of that will help determine the quality of wine, uh, what kind of varietals are used, how it's aged, and things like that. Um, 
the place designation has a name um, called AOC, the Appellation de Origin Controle, or under the European or EU, it's now AOP, Appellation de Origin Protégé or Protégé, or I am terrible at French pronunciation, but I'm going to call it AOC because what I've been calling it for 18 years now, um, AOC, AOP, everything is shifting to AOP now because of the European Union, but basically it's the same thing. So the AOC, now the AOP, basically is the governing body that designates these wines to a certain place and that creates the rules that unify these designations in a certain way. So what do we mean by that? So let's take a wine we're gonna try. I think it's gonna be our last wine. So again, excuse the mirror image. You're just gonna work with me a little bit here if you can. So wine label, look at it, take a mirror to it so you can look at it right way up. Grand Vin de Bordeaux, Grand Wine from Bordeaux. 2017 vintage, Chateau Rocher Cologne, Montagne Saint Emilion, um, Appellation, Montagne Saint Emilion, Controle. So there is your AOC. So the AOC, this winery, has met the criteria that the AOC lays out to label this not only as a Bordeaux, but a Bordeaux from a particular region. So they have to use certain grape varietals. They have to only have a certain amount of grapes harvested per hectare. Grapes, they have to be aged a certain way uh, in terms of barrel aging, for example, versus non-barrel aging, what kind of barrels they can use. Not as strict about that in Bordeaux necessarily, but still there are laws that require um, in certain regions and in certain very specific regions those types of things. And in order to be labeled an AOC Montagne Santa Mion or Pomerol, you have to follow the rules laid out by the AOC. So the AOC are the people, the, the governing group that designates these regions and what requirements are needed to label the wines as such. If that makes sense, I think I made that a lot harder than it needed to be. So, if you are buying a product that is labeled with a certain place name, what that is doing, essentially, to try to simplify it, is guaranteeing that that wine has been made in that area. It's like a, a seal of approval. If it has this on the label, it is definitely from this. It is made from these grapes and it is under the production guidelines in that area. So it's a guarantee that the wine comes from that place and that production guidelines from that area laid out by the AOC have been followed. I think that was a lot simpler than what I just did. All right, so please, let's get to the wine, right? So the first wine has kind of been my go-to right now for at least uh, two or three months. It is from Savoie. So we're talking about French Alps, mostly at the base of the Alps, uh, but actually some of the vines are planted as high as 1800 feet up. Uh, so kind of, we'll kind of get up there on the mountains. Uh, Savoie for the longest time and whites from Savoie, they do make some red, um, but mostly whites, uh, were typical, just simple, what they call chalet wines. Uh, chalets are kind of like little wooden, we, in the U.S. we call them log cabins essentially, that are kind of dotted throughout the mountainsides in the Alps. And so if you're talking cheese production and, you know, they still do it to this day, but 100 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, shepherds would basically take their, most usually cows in that region, but some sheep up the mountain and some goats during the spring and summer and bring them back down the mountain as they head into fall and winter. Um, and during the course of heading up and down the mountain, they would stay at little cabins, little chalets. They would enjoy a fresh little white wine that they would drink with 
their fondue or their raclette. Um, and they were just simple, easy drinking white wines. The quality of Savoie whites has gotten a lot, bad, a lot better, excuse me, over the last 20, 30 years or so. Modernization in wine techniques, modernization in vineyard management, um, people just taking the time to reinvest money into these areas um, has created uh, an area that still makes really fantastic value-driven wines, but that are now also really good. Um, so really nice. And it's weird. People think, well, in the Alps, are we talking about what kind of weather are we talking about? Isn't it going to be too cold to grow certain grapes? Uh, not really. In Savoie in particular, um, there's a couple of reasons why they're so successful at making wines and growing the grapes that they, they do. Uh, number one, most of the white varietals that grow there are um, conducive to slightly cooler temperatures, certainly. Um, but also, Savoie has a great little microclimate. You know, even at 1,800 feet up, you're still talking about essentially a continental climate. You have all these kind of large rivers and lakes that are kind of having this warming effect on the areas around uh, the vineyards. Um, so the, there's this kind of really cool pocket of moderate weather in this alpine region that enables people to produce uh, really nice little wines. Um, in Savoy, you can grow up to 23 different varietals that are approved by the AOC to make white wine in that region and to still be labeled Savoy. Uh, most of the better wines from that region are uh, made from Jacquer, uh, Chalas, or Altesse. Um, the wine that we're going to have today from Abin, A-B-Y-M-E-S, is 100% Jacquer. And the wine is just really nice. It's kind of medium bodied. I didn't get that because I smelled it. Um, that would be really impressive. Um, they're typically medium bodied to lighter in style. Uh, they're all, every, every Savoie I've ever had is, is pretty dry, nice minerally, uh, citrusy, tends to be a little bit floral, just fresh, vibrant, really well balanced and dry. And they actually do pair really well if you do do a fondue night or if you do have some raclette. It actually has enough acidity where it kind of cuts through a little bit of the fat of the cheese and actually goes quite well uh, with those kinds of, of dishes. So an excellent cheese wine, whether you melt them or not, type of wine. So on the nose, uh, you do get some nice I definitely get citrus, definitely some pear. Smells zesty. Yeah, and it's just great. It's great. It doesn't need food. You could just sip on this pleasantly. You know, it's like 38 degrees out today, I think, which is 38 degrees warmer than it's been for the last two weeks. So kind of wrap yourself up maybe go out on the patio, have yourself a nice little glass of Savoie, 100% Jacquer, super delicious wine, super good value, enjoy. So we just got done with our nice little white wine from Savoie. Savoie was not one of the major wine regions I mentioned from that map I showed you earlier because it's not a major wine region. Um, but it is a wine region that offers fantastic value. The next region we're going to, the next wine we're going to, is from the Loire Valley. It's actually a red from the Loire, um, but it's a Loire Valley red with a little bit of a twist, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but first, let's just kind of talk about the Loire in general. After Bordeaux and Burgundy, Champagne, Loire is right there with the Rhone as one of the most important wine regions in all of France. Um, it's it's it encompasses quite a large area um, and the variety of wines it produces uh, is quite vast um, depending upon where you are and what region you're at. 
each subregion has very specific laws and AOC designations, um, but there's so many of them that you could find almost any kind of wine style you're looking for from the Loire. So I'm gonna briefly go over the major wine regions and then talk about the wine that you're gonna get in your wine packet or in your wine club um, this week. So the Loire Valley, odds are you've had wine from here before. Um, let's start with probably the most famous wine regions in the Loire, uh, Sancerre and Puy Fume. Uh, I gave you a little map in your information packet. I'm not gonna torture you with another backwards map uh, here, but I encourage you to take a look at it, look at some of the regions. That map is, it looks like it's encompassing a lot of regions, but there's regions missing. Um, if you're looking on the map for Sancerre and Puy Fume, you're not gonna find it on that map. It's actually even much further east uh, than the last region that's labeled on your map there. But Sancerre and Puy Fume are, I mean, I don't think there's a question, the benchmark for quality Sauvignon Blancs. Um, they make the best Sauvignon Blancs in the world. Um, again, with a lot of things, French wine-wise, uh, the rest of the world bases a lot of what their Sauvignon Blancs, what they wish they would taste like, what quality they have based on the wines that come from Sancerre and Puy Fume. Uh, they are separate regions. They're literally right across the Loire River from each other, uh, so not very far apart, but best Sauvignon Blancs, Sancerre, Puy Fume. Um, Chinon, Samour, or Samour Champigny, and Bergui are also very well-known wine regions, if not here in the U.S., certainly in France. So Chinon, Samour, Bourgui are known for their reds, specifically Cabernet Franc, uh, delicious Cabernet Francs, but very different from Cabernet Francs you might get in like California, for example. Um, these are kind of gritty, spicy, um, saddle leather, good there's some fruit there, but they're typically not overly ripe, well-structured. Um, good Cabernet Franc from Samour and Chinon can age 15, 20 years pretty easy. And for some of them, you don't need to pay outrageous prices for, um, like Bernard Baudry or Alga uh make Chinon and Cabernet Franc anywhere from $25, $26 dollars up to about 50 you can put them down in the cellar and not think about them for 10 or 15 years and they'll be drinking beautifully. Um, but yeah, so those three regions, if they're red, they're gonna be Cabernet Franc. There are some rosés that come out of that region or those regions. Um, a little bit of red that is not Cabernet Franc, but not typical. So odds are if it's from those regions and it's red, you're talking Cabernet Franc. Um, Vouvray, Savignier, the uh, next two regions, uh, those are on the map, um, are, again, I keep repeating myself here, probably the best Chenin Blanc regions in the world. Um, super high quality, not a grape that's well known. There's a decent amount of Chenin Blanc planted in uh, California, uh, in New York, um, in other parts of the world, certainly. But the kind of epicenter for fantastic Chenin Blanc definitely comes from Vouvray or Sauvignier. Um, you know, and they could range, Chenin Blancs from those areas range from dry to semi-dry to very sweet and dessert wines. And even, especially in Vouvray, you could find some excellent sparkling wines made from Chenin Blanc. Um, just delicious stuff. If, if you come across any Domaine Clousel or Huey, uh, these are definitely wines worth picking up. They're magnificent. And again, they age really well. In the Loire Valley, you can find some, you know, if you're looking to build a cellar, but don't have, like myself, hundreds of dollars to spend on a bottle of wine, you know, look at those Cabernet Franc producing regions, Chinon, Bourgui, Samour. Look at those Vouvray producing regions. Vouvray ages superbly. Uh, some of the best Vouvrays and Sauvignons can age for, man, even longer than some of those Cap Francs I talked about earlier, 15, 20, 25 years, and they just, they get gorgeous. They get these kind of really honeysuckle and 
nutty notes to them, and they're really just, they're beautiful. Um, so, Vouvray, Sauvignon, Chenin Blanc. Muscadet, Muscadet is another very famous region, sub-region, sub-AOC in the Loire Valley. Uh, Muscadet is uh, made from the Melon de Bourgogne grape. Um, Muscadet is a region. It is not to be confused with Muscat, which is a grape. Completely different thing. Uh, Muscat can be made dry, but is usually used as a varietal in dessert wines um, with great effect in certain parts of the Rhone, for example, in California, um, but not the same thing. Muscadet is a wine region that's made from a white wine grape called Melon de Bourgogne. Uh, they are very dry. They are wonderfully minerally. Uh, they usually have really nice uh, zestiness. I think like lemon rind, citrus, uh, there are some that get like a little bit of nice kind of apple skin or pear to them, um, but they are outstanding wines. Muscadets are with uh, lighter fish or shellfish, and Muscadet and oysters are kind of a classic pairing. Um, you'll see a lot of other regions from the Loire in the U.S. Terrain, Cheverny, Anjou. Um, a lot of the whites from those areas can are also either Sauvignon Blanc or Chenin Blanc. And then the reds can vary. I mean, you can have Pinot Noir, people grow Gamay, um, people grow Cab Franc, uh, they grow Malbec in those regions as well. Although in the Loire, they don't call it Malbec, uh, they call it Cot. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but C-O-T is basically. So if you see uh, regions in France, with grapes called cot, C-O-T, or assoie uh, is another name for it. You're talking about Malbec, which uh, most everyone has heard of and most everyone has had some type or of another, usually from Argentina is where I bet most people have had Malbec crumb. So that's a good segue into our next wine. And our next wine is La Pepi Cote Vindipe. So, what is that? So, La, Pi, La Pepi is the name. P I P I E. Got, got that right. Cote is the grape. It's a Melbach. Um, but in this region, they call it Cote, C O T. And Vindipe is a designation that's below AOC. Now, below AOC, we're going to have two wines this month that are technically Vindipe wines. Um, that doesn't mean they are worse. Um, in fact, sometimes, especially in certain regions in France and Italy, uh, they can be better in quality. But basically, Vin de Pay is a classification of French wine that is recognized as French, obviously, but doesn't follow those AOC regulations. So the Le Pepicot is actually from Muscadet. So why is it a Vindipe and not an AOC? Well, if you remember, not but two minutes ago, we were talking about the major wine regions of the Loire. I did mention Muscadet as a major wine region of that area. However, Muscadet can only produce white wines from Melon de Bourgogne. Now, Ola Pepier, who is the producer, a lot of French words here, Pepier is the producer he has like four hectares of Malbec that grow on his estate. And he wants to make Malbec. So he went ahead and made Malbec. Um, but because it's not a white wine, obviously, that's made from Melon de Bourgogne, he cannot put Muscadet on the label because that goes against the AOC regulation. So instead, it's classified as Vin de Pay. A French wine, you know, it's you have Vin de Tavola, you used to have Vin de Tavola, French table wine classification. It's slightly above that, but it's a classification above AOC. Doesn't make it less quality. Again, it just doesn't follow those AOC guidelines that would enable Pepier to label it as a Muscadet. So instead, on the label, you'll see Vin de Pay, Va de Loire. So. It's basically a country wine, Vin de Pay, from the county or region of Loire. 
And if you notice, I don't have a bottle or glass of that with me um, because that's something I ordered just for the class. Um, this wine fits perfectly in what we're trying to do with this class in terms of finding something unique um, and delicious. Um, Malbec in Muscadet, you hardly ever see here in the United States um, with a few exceptions as with this producer. Um, it'll be very different from Malbec from Argentina. Uh, it actually goes through carbonic maceration, which means the fermentation starts before they crush the grape. So the fermentation is starting inside the grape. And we'll get into carbonic maceration in kind of greater detail in another class that we do down the road. But basically what you're doing is creating a fruit forward, easy drinking wine um, that actually could be chilled if you want and give this wine a little bit of a chill, but it kind of showcases the fruit. You're not getting oak influence. You're not getting a lot of messing around with how it's being aged. You know, it's aged in cement tanks. Um, so you're really getting a pure expression of the caught or Malbec grape. Uh, now, the other cool thing they do here is it is a natural wine. It's also fermented spontaneously. So what that means is they're fermenting the wine with wild yeast cultures, not commercial yeasts. Most wineries buy commercial pre-made yeast to put into their grape juice to start fermentation. When we're talking about wild fermentation, we're talking about the winemaker or the winery using wild indigenous yeasts that are found on the grape skins or on the vines themselves. So what, what I love about, we're really talking about natural wines here. When people are talking natural wines, they're usually, not always, but usually wild fermented. Um, and they always have very distinctive flavors. In fact, wild fermented yeast wines um, are probably the most terroir driven wines of any wines. Uh, because literally, you are fermenting these wines with cultures, flora, microflora, and bacteria that are only found in the wine, not even region, in the vineyard itself. I mean, you know, the difference in bacteria and microflora from one vineyard site to another uh, can be massive. And so you're really getting a unique expression of terroir with this wine. And again, it's not something that's going to be the most complex thing in the world. Um, you're not going to get 10 different layers of flavors out of this wine. Instead, you're just going to get a beautiful expression of what good, fresh Malbec tastes like. If I had a glass, I would toast this to you, but try it for yourself. Enjoy. We got it just for you. The next wine we're going to talk about is from another very famous wine region in France, and that's the Rhone Valley. Specifically here, we're talking about the south. Very broadly, the Rhone is divided into two regions, the Northern Rhone and the Southern Rhone. Uh, we actually did some great wines uh, from the Northern Rhone in the um, Vino File class this month. So kind of hitting Rhone in all areas and all the wine clubs. So specifically here, we're talking about Southern Rhone. Um, so we're talking specifically from Vaucluse. I'll get into Vaucluse in a second, a little north of Avignon. Um, so, but the same basic area where you get those great crew AOC, Southern Rhone wines like Chateauneuf du Pape, Gigondas, Lirac, Tavel, Carain, so on and so forth. Um, the Southern Rhone is, again, pretty vast. Uh, where the Northern Rhone is incredibly small, Southern Rhone is pretty big. And you produce all styles of wine from big bombastic Chateauneuf du Pops to super elegant, well-made rosés from Taval or Lirac um, to simple everyday table wines. Um, basically, um, Southern Rhone reds are made from Grenache, primarily, usually, again, there's exceptions here, 
which Sarah Muvedra blended into them. But you can have Shinso in there, you can have Karen Yan. Uh, the whites are even more varied, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, Clarette D, uh, Picpoul, uh, Grenache Blanc. Um, so, you know, in Chateauneuf de Pop alone, you can have up to 13 different varietals, but most reds are made up of uh, Grenache, Syrah, Mouvedra, sometimes a little Cinso, sometimes a little Carignan. Uh, the whites tend to be Grenache, Blanc, Marsan, Roussan, or Viognier based. You see this in the Mount of Claret as well, but those are the major white wines from that region as well. Uh, they've been growing grapes at least since the fourth century BC, uh, when the Greeks settled there, um, they've been a major player in the winemaking world since the Romans settled the region and started planting vines, permanent vines, and making permanent wineries there. Um, so a region with a lot of tradition and a lot of pedigree. Um, so quickly, the Rhone itself, again, AOC, we're talking about basic classifications within that AOC system. You have your basic Cote de Rhone. Well, the label will just say Cote de Rhone on it with the producer's name somewhere. Simple, nine, 10, $11 wines, fantastic value. Rhone, Southern Rhones especially, with just the basic Cote de Rhone designation, offer a spectacular value a lot of times. Uh, and then the second designation you have is Cote de Rhone Village. Um, it literally just says Cote de Rhone and then Villages. Doesn't say the name of the village, just Cote de Rhone villages. That's the next level up in terms of AOC regulation and then the producer as well. And then the next level is like Cote de Rhone villages where it'll tell you the specific name of a village. Uh, so like Cote de Rhone village and then underneath it'll say Sejure or some other village. And then at the top are your crew wines. So these are specific designated areas or regions that produce very distinctive wines, uh, usually of very high quality. And there are, I think, nine. So there are eight crews in the Northern Rhone. So nine crews in the Southern Rhone, unless they have added one when I wasn't looking. Um, and these are, again, are the Tavel, your Chateauneuf du Pop, your Gigandas, your Vacarac, Vacarac, excuse me, your Lirac, things like that. Um, interestingly enough, with this next wine, we are venturing outside of those AOC regulations again, just like we did with the Malbec. So we're going into the Vindipe territory again, but this time we're going into a Vindipe Vaucluse, which is a specific Vindipe uh, in the Rhone Valley. So whereas the last Vindipe we were talking about the Loire Valley, and this Vindipe we're talking about Vaucluse, which is in the Loire Valley. Now again, does it mean because it's not in one of those AOC designations that the wine is not as good? No, in fact, I would argue this wine, if it had Gigandas on the label or Vacaras on the label, you'd be paying $35 for this wine. All it means is that for this particular wine, the producers are not strictly following AOC guidelines. They're using grapes that the AOC don't want people using in the Rhone. They're not aging it the way they are sourcing grapes from all over the Rhone and outside of the Rhone Valley even. Um, so basically they just can't, and you won't see anywhere on the label, Cote de Rhone, Cote de Rhone Village, or the name of a village, Vindipe. This wine is Fantastic. I'm going to taste it with you here in a second, but I've tasted it many times now, four times in the last two months. Um, and it's from uh, the Brunier family, um, specifically Frederick and Danielle Brunier. Uh, but the Brunier family is responsible for Lavo Telegraph. So, uh, anybody familiar with Chateauneuf du Pop, Lavo Telegraph is one of the top Chateauneuf du Pops in that region in terms of quality and in price, as it often goes. Um, but they're sought after, they're collector's items. Um, they're super fantastic wines. Um, but, you know, Votelegraph, you're spending it, I don't know, $80, $85 at least 
for the lacrao. Um, and the family does other wines, and in this place they're doing a little declassified wine called La Pijoule. Uh La Pijoulet is Grenache, Syrah, mostly Grenache, but a little Syrah, a little Carignan, a little Cinso, and a little Mouvedre. So kind of a whole mishmash of stuff, which is fairly common in the Rhone. It's got those three grapes I talked about earlier, Grenache, Syrah, Mouvedre. It's also got a little Carignan and Cinso, so a little bit of a field blend. Um, so right, let's kind of go in and, and taste this wine. I was going to mention something else, but let's just taste the wine first. So when you smell the wine, this is the thing that hit me first is very aromatic, uh, beautiful. Um, I get very distinct Southern Rhone, Garrigue, um, spice, really herbaceous, um, cassis, blackberry, uh, you know, it's just, the nose itself is amazing. I mean, it, and it's, it smells like a, a baby Chateauneuf to pop. Um, you know, it, it, again, a lot of these grapes are coming from the Gigandas area, but, you know, again, it's just declassified and Just smells great. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Le Pijolet. Again, great pedigree. Talking about the Bernier family. Uh, the other thing I would note about this wine is something we don't often talk about enough is importers. There are certain importers of wine that are almost as important, not quite, but almost as important as producers. Most of the time, importers or who imports the wine or what company imports the wine is located on the back label of the wine. And there are certain importers I always see, or if I see, even if I've never tasted that wine before, 100%, yes, I'm buying that wine. Yes, I'll bring that wine into the store. I'm thinking Frederick Wildman. Uh, I'm thinking, well, what used to be European sellers. Um, I'm thinking this guy right here. Sorry, again, it's backward. Easy name to remember though, Kermit Lynch. Um, any wines that come in from Kermit Lynch are, are just incredible. Um, David Bowler is another great importer. Um, so there's so many wines out there. Importers have become almost as important in some ways as winemakers. And that's because they take the time and effort and do the work um, to find incredible producers and make partnerships with incredible producers work. Um, that's beneficial both to the producer themselves and the consumer. Um, so we can talk about importers maybe in another class in more detail, but it's something to look for. Kermit Lynch, Frederick Wildman, David Boulder, excuse me, Bowler, um, just to name, Europe Vin, European sellers, just to name a few. Um, there's so many great ones that specialize in France, Spain, Italy. Um, yeah, so so look for importers. Again, this wine is, uh, it's just really quite delicious. It's really surprisingly elegant on the palate. You get a really pure, fruit, and then you get all that nice spice and herbaceousness. Um, it's something that's drinking really well now. I mean, you could keep it for four to five years if you want, but uh, I, don't, I don't see a big reason to. Let it breathe a little bit if you want for an hour or two in your glass or in a decanter. It won't hurt it, but it drinks fantastic right out of the bottle and just one of the better finds we've gotten under 20 bucks in the last couple of months or so. So enjoy the Pijolet. Cheers. All right, last but certainly not least, we're gonna be talking about Bordeaux. Our last wine is from Bordeaux, um, the most famous wine region in France. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a question about that. Um, certainly the most well-known throughout the world, um, especially for collectors. Uh, Bordeaux can be a little tricky though. Um, Bordeaux, 
while making incredible wines, um, mostly red, is a very difficult place to find value. Um, can you find red Bordeaux in particular uh, for nine, ten dollars? That's good. It's getting really hard. Um, it's getting really hard in the fifteen to twenty dollar range even now. Uh, so to find something in that fifteen to twenty dollar range um, is kind of where you find your value, but you have to be careful of the producer. Um, again, sometimes inexpensive Bordeaux can be, it's not bubbly, so flat isn't exactly the right word, but lacking. Um, they can be a little green. Um, they can just be boring. Um, that being said, there are some good producers out there making good stuff for good money. Um, it's just, again, you taste through a lot of wine, uh, you trust your friendly neighborhood wine purveyor, uh, you read up on stuff, decanter, wine spectator, what have you. Um, but do your research before you buy uh, Bordeaux that are under $20, $25. There are good values to be found out there, but they're not as common as we'd like. Um, so before we get into the actual wine, let's talk about um, Bordeaux a little bit as a wine region. Um, I'm going to torture you with the backwards map just one more time. Um, just because I want to show you, people when they talk about Bordeaux, a lot of times they talk about left bank, right bank. What does that mean exactly? Well, there's an estuary that breaks off the Atlantic called the Gironde, and then eventually which breaks into like the Dordogne River, um, and actually splits into two rivers. Uh, but basically, the estuary and rivers split the Bordeaux into two distinct areas or regions, very broad regions. And so, essentially, the region on the left side of the river or the estuary is the left bank. Sorry, I'll hold that up a little better. So, left bank right here. The side of the land on the right side of the estuary and the river is where you get your right bank. And then like in between, you get like Entre de Mer, it's almost like a little island between the two where you get some great value whites. Um, you can actually find some great value white wines in Bordeaux. And then a little further south, you get into like Barsac and Sauterne, which make incredible sweet dessert wines. Um, but we're gonna be talking mostly about reds and in particular the right bank. Um, so, the two most popular regions on the right bank for red wines are Pomerol and Saint Emilion. Um, on the right bank, quick, very generalization in terms of differences between the right bank and the left bank. The right bank tends to be more Merlot based, the left bank tends to be more Cabernet Sauvignon based. Now, with the red wines in Bordeaux, you can use up to five varietals Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cab Franc, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Uh, Carmenere used to be one of the grapes that you can use in Bordeaux, but that's since it's bygone now. It, it's those five grapes, uh, and that's again an AOC classification of Bordeaux. Those are the five red grapes you can use for the red wines if you want to have Bordeaux or a specific AOC designated region from Bordeaux on your label. Um, so left bank Cabernet Sauvignon based, right bank Merlot based. Now. The major regions of both banks, Pauillac, Saint Julian, Margot, uh, on the left side, on the left bank, Saint Estef, Pomerol, Saint Emilion on the right, tend to be very pricey. Um, they'll start a lot of times at, you could find some in the 30 to 40 dollar range, but that's getting harder and harder now. You're mostly looking at at least 50 dollars for wines from any of those major wine AOC appellations in Bordeaux. And you can go up when you're talking about like Chateau Angelis or La Pin or Lafitte Rothschild, um, uh, Cheval Blanc, you know, you're getting into five, six, eight hundred, two thousand dollars sometimes per bottle, uh, depending upon the vintage and the specific winery um, that we're talking about. Um, so 
where do you find value then in Bordeaux if we're talking about those kind of price range uh, on the left bank and the right bank? Well, for reds, you're looking for slightly more general um, appellation designations. So if you're on the left bank, you would look for something like Cote Bordeaux or Medoc or Hot Medoc. Um, on the right bank, you can look for what's called like these little satellite regions. So like in Pomerol, you also have regions right next to it called uh, Fronzac, Canon Fronzac, Lalande de Pomerol, although even those are getting a little pricier now. Um, but in saint Emilion, you have satellites and the satellite regions are more kind of apropos for saint Emilion than Pomerol, to be honest. But saint Emilion has a number of satellites. And one of them is Montagne Santa Mion, and the last wine that we're going to have today is Chateau Rocha Cologne from Montagne Saint Amillon. Um, there's also Lusac Saint Amillon, there's also Saint George Saint Amillon. So basically, these are regions located adjacent or right next to Saint Amillon, uh, made in similar styles, have similar vineyard soil makeups, same general climate. Uh, not quite as prestigious, not quite as amazing, uh, although some can get incredibly good. Um, also not the same reputation, um, but they do represent a lot of times really good value. And satell why do they call them satellites? You know, think of it as orbits surrounding a planet or moons, excuse me, orbiting a planet. Um, think of it like if Iowa City is St. Emilion, and we're talking about the greater Iowa City like Coralville or Lib North Liberty. Um, those would be satellites, so to speak, in terms of what we're kind of talking about here. Um, so the Chateau Rochard Cologne from Montagne Saint Emilion, so we're talking right bank, a satellite of Saint Emilion, so we're talking about mostly Merlot, and that's what this wine is, a vast majority of it is made from Merlot. And we'll take a little swirl, take a little sniff. Ooh, that's nice. So a lot of nice, kind of more red fruit than dark fruit. A little bit almost cedar, a little bit of wood spice, but not much. I mean, it actually smells a really well balanced wine. You get a few, number four or five different things in there, but nothing is kind of jumping out. Doesn't smell like too much oak, doesn't smell like too much fruit, doesn't smell like too much wood spice. Hmm. That is super pleasant. That is really good. Um, this is something I would happily sip any time of year, um, more medium bodied, not as rich or full bodied as uh, some of the bigger Bordeaux can get, but really smooth. There's some tan in there, but it's not too astringent. It's kind of on the softer side. Does have a dry finish to it. Has a pretty nice finish. Well, really well made. So I'm actually surprised I had this wine last week. I knew it was well made, but again, I am secondarily delighted and surprised um, by how good this is for under 20 bucks. This is exactly what I want for a good value Bordeaux. I would happily spend $25, $30 for this wine. Um, yeah, this is great. Cheers. I hope you liked all the wines. Uh, take a second to like us or do whatever you're supposed to do with the YouTube videos. Um, only our second attempt at this, as I said, as we get more popular and famous, all the great graphics and uh, other things will, will come, maybe, we'll see. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed as much as I did these uh, wines and I uh, really enjoyed doing this class and we'll see you next month for what I believe is an Italian themed class. Have a great one, we'll see you soon.